Very good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to Sunday at BGF. Oops, sorry. Very good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to Sunday at BGF. Let us start off this Sunday with a short Buddha Puja. Let us uh, recite together as I lead the Puja. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gachami, damang saranang gachami, sangkang saranang gachami, dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami, dutiampi damang saranang gachami, dutiampi sangkang saranang gachami. Tatiampi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiampi damang saranang gachami Tatiampi sangkang saranang gachami Panati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami Adina dana veramani sikha Apadang samadhyami Kame sumichachara veramani sikhapadang samadhyami Musavada veramani sikhapadang samadhyami Surameraya majapamadathana veramani sikhapadang samadhyami with this of love and compassion, I purify my action. With selfless giving, I purify my action. With moderation and contentment, I purify my action. With truthful words, I purify my speech. With clear mindfulness and calmness, I purify my thought. May all beings be happy. Sabe Sata Sukihonto. Let me give a short introduction from Mother Billy Tan. Today's talk is on the title Cognition Precedes All Experiences. It is based on the Dhammapada verses 1 and 2 as uh, translated by the late Venerable Punaji. Brother Billy Tan is a retired business development consultant, certified master practitioner of neuro linguistic programming, NLP, a clinical hypno hypnotherapist laughter yoga teacher and laughter ambassador. In sharing the Dhamma, Brother Billy studied under the late Venerable Dr. M. Punaji Mahatera and has delivered Dhamma sharing throughout Peninsular Malaysia. In recent years, Brother Billy has also shared the Dhamma extensively in the Philippines as resident Dhamma lecturer at Wisdom Park, Manila, as well as to Catholic seminary students, universities, theosophical societies, and also to the inmates at the women's prison in Metro Manila. So let us welcome Brother Billy Tan to share the Dhamma talk, after which we'll open up to our questions and answers. For those who are listening in from Facebook, kindly type your questions in the Facebook chat and we will copy and paste into Zoom here and Billy Tan will answer the questions. Okay, so over to you, Brother Billy Tan. Thank you, Sadhu, to you, brother. Uh, happy morning. And today's topic is cognition precedes all experiences. This is based on the first verse of the Dhammapada, the first two verses, actually, because they are twin verses. In the Dhammapada, the first chapter is 
basically called the twin verses, whereby the Buddha has uh, spoken two verses that are opposites, beginning with one which is about evil, and then the second verse is about goodness. So today's sharing, I will be using Bhante Punaji's translation, as well as a translation of another very uh, revered scholar uh, in Singapore, uh, another monk, Bhante Sarada. And let us begin. Now, I have, uh, I have uploaded this document. It's the PDF file containing the presentation slides. So you can actually download now if you wish to, so that you can follow the presentation with the slides. Let us begin by taking a quick look at the first verse in Pali, but we're going to listen to a short chant of this verse by Bande Indaratana. I think many of you are very familiar with Bande Indaratana, who is very well known for his excellent chanting voice and his very perfect uh, diction and Pali chants. Okay, so let's see what he chants. Manu Pumbangama Dhamma Manu Sintha Manu Maya Manesa That is the first verse, and there's a story behind it. So before we go into the actual translation, let's take a look at the story behind this first verse. It began with a very uh, popular monk by the name of Venerable Chakupala. Uh, he was middle-aged and blinded uh, due to some condition. He was blinded since birth. As a result of his very devoted practice and his very ardent practice, he had already attained arahantship. So he was already an arahant, but of course a blind arahant. So one day, the Buddha was residing in Jetavana Monastery in Savati. So Venerable Chakupala decided to visit the Buddha to pay homage to the Buddha. So he arrived at the monastery and he then resided in the monk's quarters. That evening, he decided to do walking meditation. So he was pacing up and down in meditation just outside his, uh, his quarters. Uh, but because he was blind and unable to see, and he did not really have psychic powers, so to speak, so he actually accidentally stepped on some insects that happened to be crawling by. So he accidentally stepped on them and killed those insects unknowingly, unintentionally. Of course, there, there were a lot of monks residing in the monastery and a lot of young monks. Uh, you must also understand in those days, uh, it is understandable in any environment that there are young monks who are trying to compete for the Buddha's attention. These are unenlightened monks. So some monks walk, came out and saw the dead insects just outside Chakupala's quarters. And then they thought very badly of him. They thought that, what is this monk doing? He's stepping on the insects unmindfully and so on. So they reported the matter to the Buddha and said to the Buddha, why is this monk killing insects? He should not be killing. He's not even following the first precept. So the Buddha asked them whether they actually witnessed Chakupala killing the insects. Of course, uh, the Chakupala's walking meditation was at night and there was no one around, so they did not witness. So they answered in the negative. Then the Buddha went on to say, just as you had not seen him killing, so also he had not seen those living insects. 
Besides, Chakupala already attained Arahatship. He could not have any intention of killing, so he was innocent. Basically, what Buddha was trying to say is that uh, you did not see Chakupala step on the insects. And in the same way, because Chakupala was blind, he did not see the insects. At the same time, the Buddha pointed out that Chakupala had already become enlightened. And a person who has enlightened has already completely eradicated all lust and greed, anger and ill will and delusion of self. So the Chakupala had already eradicated those. Therefore, he would not have any intention to harm any life. And he stepped on those insects basically by accident because he was not able to see. So those young monks were very curious. They wanted to know why is it that Chakupala had become blind? So they asked why Chakupala was born blind. And the Buddha then told them the story of Chakupala. As you would probably know, Buddha has what is called Tevija, three, uh, three knowledges, supreme knowledges. He could see his own past life. He could also see other people's past life and how people are committing karma. So he could see all these things. So he was able to then know the background of Chakupala. And he basically said in his past lives, Chakupala was a physician. And in those days, a physician is like an Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic uh, doctor, you know, so uh, doing, using herbs to cure people. So Chakupala was treating a blind lady in one of his past lives when he was a physician. At that time, Chakupala was able to see, I mean, in his past life, as a physician, he was a seeing physician. And he was treating this blind lady. And he was very excellent uh, as, a, as a physician. That's why people go to him. And the blind woman had promised to Chakupala that, uh, that uh, she, together with her children, would become servants or slave to the physician if the physician could fully restore her sight. In other words, she wanted to be able to see and if the physician was able to restore her sight, she would be willing to work for him for life together with her children and serve him like a slave. Soon, it was working, soon she gradually regained her sight. Now she's able to begin to see. So her sight was gradually regaining. And then she started to think, oh, uh, why should I be her slave? Uh, why should I be his slave? You know, it's his job to cure me. So fearing that she and her children would have to become slaves to the physician, she thought of trying to cheat the physician, try to lie to, him, to the physician. So she told him that her eyes were actually getting worse when in fact the opposite was happening. They were getting cured. She was already regaining her sight, but she told the physician, oh, well, it's getting worse. I can't see, fearing that she would have to be his slave. But the physician, he knew that. I mean, he knew that she was getting better, knew she was deceiving him, and at that time, the physician had this intention. He was very vicious, had this vicious intention. I cure you, now you want to cheat me. So he actually gave that lady another ointment and told her, oh, now you use this and you will be completely healed. So she did, but actually it made her blind again because that ointment actually made her blind all over again. So he did a very evil thing, a very vicious intention, intentionally causing her to be blind again. Therefore, as a consequence of that very evil karma, uh, this very evil deed, the physician lost his eyesight many times in subsequent existences. In some cases, he was born blind. In some cases, he was born normal and then became blind and so on. And finally, becoming Chakupala, he was blinded at birth. But because over the many lifetimes, I think the, the physician who had been reborn or Chakupala in his previous lives started cultivating and eventually when he was Chakupala, he had then attained Arahanship. He had become enlightened after following the Buddha. So this is the story behind how uh, the Buddha decided to utter those verses that if one had these evil intentions, then uh, 
evil, then, then bad things will follow you. So basically, the popular translation, and I'm using one of the most popular translation, this is by Venerable Narada Mahadeva. So this is the one where he translated. Mind is the forerunner of all evil states. I think many of us are very familiar with this. Mind is the forerunner of all evil states. In this first verse, it is evil. The second verse later on, it is good. So here, it's all evil states. And he says, mind is chief. That means mind is predominant. Mind made are they. That means everything is created in the mind. So if one speaks or acts with wicked mind, because of that, suffering follows one, even as the wheel follows the hoof of the drawn ox. That means if we begin to speak and act with evil mind, and as a consequence of the bad karma, because here it is with intention, so as a consequence of this evil karma, we will experience suffering. And the suffering will follow us like as though the wheel of the cart is following the hoof of the ox. That means as the animal draws the cart, the wheel follows. And this is how suffering will keep following us when we act or speak with wicked or ill intentions. And this is actually a very beautiful metaphor for suffering because here the Buddha used the ox and a cart. So the drawing the cart is a very suffering thing. I mean, the poor ox, day in, day out, has to draw these very heavy loads. So it's really suffering. So this metaphor of using the wheel following the hoof is actually brilliantly uh, explains how one experiences suffering. So this is a very wonderful way of Buddha presenting it. And this is one of the great wisdom of the Buddha when he taught people he used very relevant, down-to-earth uh, examples and metaphors so that people could easily understand. So you can easily understand how suffering comes if you are the ox drawing that cart. So this is really what that verse is all about. But uh, there is something about the translation. I'm going to show you some examples of translations. The one you saw just now is by Venerable Narada. He says, mind is the forerunner of all evil states. Let's just focus on the first two lines. Mind is the forerunner of all evil states. Mind is chief. Mind made are they. There's nothing wrong with that basically as it stands, but I'll come to uh, my concern in a moment. Let's look at another popular verse by another very famous translator, I think, uh, he was one of my favorite before, Acharya Buddha Rakita. He says, mind precedes all mental states. Basically, it's the same. Right? Mind is the chief. They are all mind made or mind route. Route is basically making something, doing something. They are all mind made, created by mind. If with impure mind, a person speaks or acts, suffering follows him like the wheel that follows the feet of the ox. So this is fairly standard. The second part is fairly straightforward. And then here is a very interesting one. Um, I'm just showing you to highlight so many scholars, they have their own opinions, they have their own views. So they translate in their own ways. But do remember, uh, Narada was Sri Lankan, so to him, Pali language was almost like uh, his own, uh, he was so used to it, it's related to his own mother tongue, Sinhalese. The same way, Acharya Buddha Rakita was also Sri Lankan, so he again was able to relate to uh, Pali in a very uh, deep way. But here is a Western monk, Tanisaro Bhikkhu. I'm not criticizing him, I'm just pointing out his translation. Here it is very interesting, he says, Phenomena are preceded by the heart. Now he says heart. Ruled by the heart. Made of the heart. It's created by the heart. If you speak or act with a corrupted heart, then suffering follows you as the wheel uh, of the track of the ox that pulls it. Right? So he used heart instead of mind. 
which is interesting. But uh, I'm not going to use this translation because I find it uh, does not resonate with what I understand. So let's take a look at those two translations where these two monks, to them, Pali is almost like a native language. So they were able to translate it uh, in this way. But I was a little bit uh, hesitant to try to take it as it is because there was something that was kind of bothering me a little because they used the word mind. Now, if you, uh, uh, if you have been spending time like I have, spending a lot of time investigating uh, and studying psychology and also uh, investigating with the use of findings from neuroscience and medicine, you will realize that mind is not just one thing. You know, we don't just have a mind as it is. There are three things going on. The Buddha used three words to describe the mind. So using the word mind is too, uh, too broad, too uh, generalized. And at the same time, the other thing that I was a little bit concerned about is that here the translation says wicked mind or impure mind. Again, mind is just an activity, right? Mind by itself is not wicked. It is not pure. It is the activity directed at an unwholesome thing or directed in an unwholesome manner that is wicked. Mind by itself is not wicked. And you have heard in some sutras, luminous mind, our mind by itself, the natural, the nature of the mind is pure. So the mind itself is pure. It is the way we apply the mind that makes it either wholesome, unwholesome, wicked, or kind or good. So it's the way we apply mind. So these two translations, uh, these two terms here kind of got me thinking. And fortunately, during the same time, I was actually very interested in Dhammapada verses in the early days when I started to learn Theravadan because I came from a different background. Just quickly, I started off in Mahayana, then I moved on to Tibetan. And then finally, when I discovered some of the, the Pali translations from the Pali Canon, I got interested in Theravadan and I met my teacher, Venerable Dr. Punaji. So he had been very helpful to me and I studied under him. And then I realized that only in Theravada are you able to study the original teachings of the Buddha. Because from other traditions, I was learning a lot of other things. Now, I don't want to criticize any other schools, but basically I'm just pointing out because of Bhante Punanji, I had been able to study under him, learn a lot from him and understood as much as I could the original teachings of the Buddha. And because he was an excellent translator from Pali to English, because he was one of those people I knew who had an excellent command of English. His command of the English was impeccable. He was able to choose very excellent words. So let's listen to what he has to say about what is the mind. See, the Buddha used three words to describe the mind. So let's now take a look at a, uh, a, a video clip on how Bhante Punaji was very simply explaining what is mind. Now, mind is an activity, remember. Mind is not like the brain. The brain is an entity. It's an object. It's something that you can, you can feel here, see or touch or whatever. It's an object. It's a physical thing. But mind is an activity. It's not physical. It's not an entity. It is an activity. So in other words, it's either an entity, which is something that is physical and existential, or it is an activity, which is something that is ongoing. There are processes. Now, mind by itself is pure. It is the way we direct our minds to think of something, to do something, to have certain intentions that makes our action impure. It is our activity, our, our behavior that is not pure. So let's listen to Bandi Puniji's explanation. What we call the mind, the Buddha said, there are three words that the Buddha used to refer to the mind. Chitta, Mano, and Vijnana. Chitta, Mano, and Vijnana. 
the word vijnana what are called vijnana is i perception chakku vijnana ear perception sota vijnana nose perception gana vijnana tang perception jiva vijnana body perception kaya vijnana like that different perceptions that is simply the activity of the senses sensory activity and then he used the word mano to refer to the activity of the brain the thinking part mano vijnanam this the activity of the brain and then he pointed out that there is another thing that is what is called chitta that means the emotional reaction it is the chitta that gets emotionally agitated the chitta can remain in two ways either emotionally agitated or it can be in a tranquil state that is the the word that we can use is the english word is the mood or temperament temper or mood or temperament that means it can be in a we say we speak of a person in a good mood or calm mood or maybe agitated mood so it's the mood that is the chitta so the important thing here is that the chitta refers to a part of the brain that is in the mammalian brain that is called the limbic system that limbic system is the part of the brain that produces emotions there is a special place called the amygdala uh, billy knows all these things he, he has been showing these things in the diagrams <laughs> uh the important thing is the emotions are coming from the chitta so the buddha has been mentioning these things although he didn't use the words that the modern people are using but the chitta refers to that limbic part limbic system and uh, the thinking part is done by what is called the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex uh, it's also called the neocortex and uh, this area of the brain that does the thinking and that is very important to understand that is the mano the word mano was used to refer to that thinking part which is the real human brain okay so bante was trying to explain uh, the what the buddha was uh, yeah. one moment i'll just okay how the buddha used three words to describe the mind chitta mano and vijnana Let's take a look at what Bhante explained just now. He says, Vijnana refers to the perception coming from the sense organs. So the real meaning of Vijnana is this awareness of objects that you are able to see and sound that you're able to hear. So in the case of seeing, it happens when light enters the eye and it stimulates the uh, sense of uh, the uh, nerves and these optic nerves send impulses to the brain and then there's a mental image arising and this mental image arising in the mind that is called rupa and that is really what rupa is but this is where a lot of people have translated rupa uh, to mean object meant uh, something that is physical but it's not it's arising in the mind it's actually a mental image arising in the mind of what was seen with the eye and you can see there are all these different nerves so nerves are uh, optic nerves carry from the eye auditory nerves 
and other nerves or factory nerves from smell, from taste, and from touching. So these are five physical senses which are actually found in the body. So in other words, mind is not just happening inside the brain. And this is where a lot of people misunderstood. They think, oh, the mind is only happening in the brain. No, the brain is the command center. And it's, it's basically the, it's the, I wouldn't call it the supervisor, but it's like a command center coordinating stuff. But mind is involving various parts of the body. So in this case, this part of the mind called vijnana perception is involving sense organs. And basically our brain is such that it is made of three main parts. It is the command center, but it is not only happening inside the brain. So these sense uh, optic nerves and all the other nerves are coming through the spinal cord, entering the brain. So that is why that part of the brain, you could say is associated with sensory perceptions. What I'm showing here is it is associated with mainly, not that it is only, only that part of the brain is involved with sensory perception. Sensory perceptions involves all your sense organs. That means it's throughout your body, including touch, which is your skin. Your skin is sensing touches and every single part of your body has your skin down to the tip of your toe. So in other words, the whole body itself is involved with vinyana. But the, the nerves that carry the signal go into the brain through this spinal cord entering the brain stem. Right? Then of course, in the same way, it passes through the limbic system and that is where it triggers an arousal of emotion. Again, when emotions are aroused, the limbic system is often called the emotional brain. And Bhante calls this part of the mind chitta, which is actually mood and temperament. I'll come to the details of, of the Buddha's explanation of the three parts of the mind later, but I'm just talking about the brain from, for now. So when emotions are aroused, limbic system is the command center. There is one tiny structure in the limbic system called the amygdala, which is very sensitive and sensing everything. And when it is aroused, it triggers a chain reaction sending signals to various parts of the body, various glands, releasing hormones. And this activity causes us to feel sensations all over the body. That's why emotion is very physical. The first thing we notice about emotion is the whole body changes. Our muscles are getting tense, our heart beating faster, and then we feel uncomfortable and all that because of this limbic system being uh, the, the, the amygdala in the limbic system being aroused and sends signals throughout the body to release hormones and cause all kinds of bodily sensations. That's why when we talk about emotion, we also talk about bodily sensations. Like when you want to cry, you could feel it, right? And you can even feel the sourness in your mouth when you want to cry. That is all physical sensations. At the same time, all these signals finally reaches the outer part of the brain called the cerebral cortex. And that's where we become, uh, we are able to think. We're able to think about it. Now, all these are not happening like one after another. They are not really, it's all happening at the same time. The moment you sense something, you feel something. The moment you sense and feel something, you think of something. It all happens at the same time. It's called concurrence. And that's why Bhante described this as uh, antecedental concurrence. That means everything is happening logically at the same time when certain conditions arise, an outcome will arise immediately. There is no delay. Uh, so all this is happening at the same time. So that outer part of the brain is the command center for your thinking. But at the same time, when you start to think something, it sends signals to your body. Like if you think you want to pick up a glass, it sends signals to your muscles to move your hand to do something. So thinking also involves all this activity. So thinking is not just only inside the brain, again, but the brain is the command center. It's just that it also involves the whole body. And the mind, therefore, involves the whole body. When we speak of the mind, in the way that the Buddha explained it with uh, vinyana, chitta, and mano, it also involves the whole body per se. So when we talk about vinyana, or sensing, just now we talked about light entering the eyes and then we are able to see the same thing. 
air vibration. Now sound entering the ear is actually just air vibration. And then it vibrates uh, ear, the eardrum, which is connected to three tiny little bones. And those three bones actually amplify it and sh shakes a little, uh, little structure inside called the cochlea. And that is where it senses vibration of the air and sends the signal to the brain and we are able to hear. In the same way, we're able to smell. In the same way, we're able to uh, taste. And finally, we're able to touch. So these are five senses, five different physical senses bringing information to the brain. And the brain collects them and, and puts them, tries to sort of uh, put them together, pile them up together. That's why it's called panchakanda. Right? It's five uh, things piled on each other. So there are five processes and there are actually six parts of this experiences. The five are physical, which is from the sense organ, and the six is the mind. And that is what is called mano. So basically, mano is the part that brings it all together and that mano creates cognition. And we are able to cognize what we have seen. I'll explain that in a moment. So the mano is the sixth sense. Now, what comes in through the senses? So the vinyana that comes in through the five senses, they are called perception. They are not consciousness. Unfortunately, the word vinyana is translated as consciousness. If you were to ask a psychologist or a neuroscientist in modern day, modern science, the word consciousness means much more than this. The word consciousness also refers to a sense of self, the awareness of self. We are self-aware. So that's why some, some people, I, I don't subscribe to that, but some people say, oh, only human beings are conscious because human beings are self-aware. But actually, it's not true. Even animals can be self-aware. So basically, these sensations coming in through the sense organs, they are the perceptions. So vinyana referring to these five senses are perceptions. But vinyana referring to the mind, that is cognition. And that is consciousness. So let's take a look at these six sense base, six types of vinyana. The first five are from the sense organs, chaku, sota, gana, jiva, and kaya vinyana. So these are perception from the five senses. It's only the mind, the mano vinyana. Sometimes it's uh, called chitta vinyana, but actually the two are really referring to the same thing. It's the part of the mind, cognition of sense perception. That we can say consciousness, because when it puts it all together, it begins to create a, 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 in the mind the impression there's a world out there, objective experience, there's a world out there. And then there is a subjective experience. There is me in here. That's why it's all illusions created in the mind, that there is a world out there because of the five senses. And then there is a me in here. And that is really consciousness. So cognition and uh, uh, consciousness and conception and thinking, categorization and intellect, our thinking. So these are the six types of vinyana. Only the mano vinyana, the mind consciousness, can you call it consciousness? The rest are really perception. Eye perception, ear perception, nose perception, tongue perception, and body perception. Okay, so this is vinyana. And at the same time, it is being processed. So this, there are these three parts of this mental experience we call mind. So mind is not one thing. It's three things happening simultaneously. Right? Antecedental concurrence happening at the same time when certain conditions arise, it all happens. So we spoke about vinyana already. So this is the process of perception, uh, what is commonly translated as panchakanda. From panchakanda, it produces vinyana we become aware of what was perceived through our sense organs. So that vinyana is really just awareness. Vinyana does not refer to self-awareness. There is no self involved. Self comes in, in, in mano and chitta when they act together. So in the mano part, it begins to process all this and produce cognition and conception. Cognition is basically categorized identification of the perceived mental image of the object. Because in Vinyana, it produces a mental image called Rupa. That is a mental image of what is seen with the eyes, heard with the ears, and so on. 
So this mental image arises, and that is uh, when that then Mano process it, and this processing is trying to identify what was seen, and this process is called papancha. Basically, papancha is the process of categorized identification. Some people translated papancha as mental proliferation. It's not. It's actually mental proliferation is later after this. Mental proliferation involves a whole lot of other things, right, including memory, expectations, and the sense of self, and so on. At this point, it is purely identifying uh, what the object is. Like if I show you this, straight away you can see this is a mouse. How do you know it's a mouse? Because you have seen hundreds of mouse before. For most of you, majority of you, this is the first time you see this particular mouse. And yet you know it's a mouse. See? Why? Because you have seen hundreds of different mouses before, similar to this. And therefore, the mind is able to identify it based on categorized identification, categorization. All the mouse look alike. So when you see something that looks like a mouse, you call it a mouse, right? So this is really that first part of Vinyana, uh, first part of Mano, cognition. At the same time, with cognition, memory arises and we begin to create ideas, and that is called conception. Cognition is basically categorized identification. Conception is the story behind what you have identified. So we begin to cognize the experience. And when you cognize the experience, this whole process of cognizing the experience, that is really called Dharma. Again, a lot of people have thought that the word Dharma is truth. No, that's not. It is just used in context to refer to the teachings of the Buddha, which they call truth. But actually, the teachings of the Buddha is really not truth, so to speak. The teachings of the Buddha is the Buddha's experience. What the Buddha taught in those 45 years was his experience of becoming enlightened. So the Buddha was actually teaching from his experience. He was not teaching some truth coming from heaven and say, this is the truth. These are the commandments or these are, this is the truth. When the Buddha laid down the precepts, it was not like commandment from heaven and say, thou shalt not kill. No, it's basically what the Buddha has experienced, that killing is unwholesome. So he's teaching us his experience. So in this case, it is just cognizing the experience with concepts. So we begin to draw from memory, we begin to have imaginations, and we begin to have expectations. And with all this, we begin to have different ideas. With ideas come choices. So this is what Mano is dealing with. Cognition of what was perceived through the senses and then uh, concepts behind what you have cognized and choices. And this is what Mano does. Now the chitta is all happening at the same time. When the chitta senses something, the chitta actually senses whether the, the feeling of something, that feeling is called Vedana. Whether whatever we have seen, heard, smelled, taste, or touch, is it pleasant or unpleasant? And then triggers a reaction. And that reaction is tanha. Again, tanha is normally translated as craving. But Bhante Punaji explained it so beautifully and so precisely. Tanha is really emotional reaction. If it is something pleasant, our emotional reaction is what? Oh, lust and greed. If it is something unpleasant, what is our emotional reaction? Oh, anger and hatred. We want to get rid of it. Now, if it is something neither pleasant nor unpleasant, we begin to sense, oh, we're experiencing something. There must be the I, me, or mind behind it. So, loba, dosa, moha are the three types of reaction, three types of tanha that is happening. So, therefore, tanha is really emotional reaction, not craving. If you see something unpleasant and you want to get rid of it, how can you be craving? You're craving for what? You know, you can't be craving. You can't be desiring for it. You want to get rid of it. So it's, it's really that reaction of wanting to get rid of it. And that leads to mood and temperament. What is mood? Mood is how you feel about something. If it is something that is pleasant, oh, you feel good. So you're in a good mood. If it is something unpleasant, you don't feel good. You're in a bad mood. Temperament is your emotional urge. Now you get an urge to want to react. And that reaction is tanha. So that urge to react is all part of what chitta is dealing with. Again, chitta, although I, in that earlier picture, I drew it 
it's connected, associated with the brain, but it's only associated with the limbic system of the brain, but it involves the whole body. You know, uh, the whole body releases all kinds of hormones, make us feel tense and all that. So really, chitta, mano, or vinyana is really not only confined in the brain, they involve the whole body too. Right? That's the important thing also. So therefore, chitta is this mood and temperament. At the same time, we begin to have this sense of self. Right? So we begin to personalize every experience. And this is called upadana. So, uh, and this leads to the notion that I exist because I am feeling it. I am seeing it. I am hearing it. The I, me, or mine is so strong. We begin to think that I exist. And this notion of self-centered existence is bhavatana. We, I exist. So it leading, leading to this notion of self-centered uh, existence. And that's why we think we exist. Because we cling on. Uh, the word upadana is often translated as clinging, uh, grasping, attachment. Nothing wrong with those translations. But Bhante Purnaji used a more precise translation and that is personalizing the experience. Why did he say personalizing? It's very simple because upadana comes from two main Pali words. Upa, which means within. Upa, and then adana. Adana is the opposite of dana. What is dana? Dana is giving. I give. That is dana. Adana, what is the opposite of giving? Taking. So upa adana simply means taking it inside. So personalizing. That's why it's translated as clinging, grasping, but more accurately, or it's also called attachment. More accurately, it is personalizing the experience because it creates a personal personality view. That's why this word is more accurate. This translation is more accurate. Personalizing the experience because it creates this personality view. So now I hope you have a basic understanding of the three parts of the mind. And this is why I was not very comfortable when I saw the translation that mind is impure. As you can see here, right? Vinyanya. In Vinyanya itself is pure. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Vinyanya. Mano. Mano is just interpreting. But the real impurity comes with the chitta. So the mind by itself as a whole is not impure. It is the way our, we direct our chitta. It's the way we direct our intention. It's the way we decide. With the mano, we make choices. It is the choices we make that makes, it makes us behave in an unwholesome way. Right? The mind by itself is not impure. Mind by itself is not wicked. It is our intention. And that intention is chetana. It is those three things that come together. Chetana is your intention, your action is karma, and the outcome you produce is vipaka. And these three go, go together. Right? So it is this chetana that is impure. And chetana arises because of our defilements. Right? So let's listen to Bande Punaji explaining this first verse of Dhammapada. Uh, by the way, uh, this picture it's very, I, I love this picture even better than the earlier one. Many of you may not know, but this is actually a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Just a sideline, uh, sidetrack a bit. This is a painting by Vincent van Gogh, but this picture actually again illustrates how the wheel of the cart follows the hoof of the animal that draws it. So let's listen to Bande Purnaji explain Dhammapada verse 1. The first words in the Dhammapada, they are in the first words in the Dhammapada, what you get is Mano Pubbangama Dhamma, which is wrongly translated today. There, Mano means the thinking part. I told you there are two things the thinking part and the emotional part, which is called chitta. Mano Pubbangama means the thinking part comes first before the emotional part. So it is by changing the thinking part, which is what is called the cognitive part, that the affective can be controlled. 
So it is the thinking part that is able to control. And that is the real secret discovered in the modern world by the cognitive psychologists. They are using that in what is called cognitive psychotherapy. They are using that principle, but still they are not able to fully control the emotions because they don't know about meditation. And, uh, but the Buddha used this method Okay. So he, there Bhante mentioned about the Buddha used a method called the meditation. Meditation is the process that helps us purify the mind. So one of the first thing meditation does is the first part of meditation is to still the chitta. This is actually explained in many sutras and, and many places that uh, samatha meditation, the first process of meditation is samatha meditation, tranquility meditation, is actually stilling the chitta, bringing the chitta to a state of stillness. So the chitta doesn't react. So we're not emotional. So the whole idea is to stop the emotions. So that first part of meditation where we enter into jhanas is to stop emotions completely. And when you're able to su suppress your emotion, you are really suppressing the five hindrances. So that's what meditation is about. So that's a, just a quick side word. Okay, Bhante's translation is very straightforward. He says, cognition, thinking. Cognition here refers to the thinking process. In other words, it's not mind as a whole, but specifically the thinking precedes all experiences. Dharma, everything we experience. It is our thinking behind it. This is why the mind creates everything. So it's predominant and it creates our reality. If you think somebody is kind to you, then that is your reality. That is a kind person to you. If you think somebody is, is cruel to you, that is your reality. You, that in your mind, he's a cruel person. So what you think is really creating your reality. And it is what is predominant. It is what is really overriding the way you speak and the way you act. So in other words, the way you interpret your circumstances overrides the way you speak and the way you act. If you interpret this person to be a good person, a kind person, then you will speak and act towards him in a very kind way. But if you interpret that person to be a nasty, cruel person, the way you speak or act to him might be directed towards uh, reacting to his cruelty and so on. So really, cognition precedes all experiences. It predominates and creates them. And then, vicious thought. It's not cruel mind. It's not wicked mind. It's vicious thought. Your mind is now directed at something vicious, something wicked, something with ill will. So with vicious mind, if you speak or act, then you will experience suffering, just like the carriage of the wheel uh, sorry, just as the wheel follows the hoof of the animal that draws it. So that last part is, is quite common, but it is the important thing is our thinking, cognition. It is the thinking that precedes our experience. It predominates. At this point, I'd like to point out to you another teacher. I never met him, but I, he's still around. He's based in Singapore at the Singapore Buddhist Meditation Society, Bhante Sarada. He had written a he had written an illustrated Dhammapada. I'll give you the link later on, you can download. And his translation is again very precise, almost very, very similar to Bhante Purnaji. I wouldn't like to use the word exact, but it's almost like a, uh, almost exact. So he says the term or the phrase, Mano Pubangama, simply means thought proceeds. He didn't say mind, he says thought. Dharma, experience. So Mano Pubangama Dharma is thought precedes all experiences. Mano Seta, thought is predominant. Mano Maya, created by thought. So Mano here is used to refer to the thinking, the thought, not the emotions. Right? It is not the heart, as what Tano, uh, Tanisaro Biku was translating as heart, but it's not, it's the thinking. 
And Mano, again, Manasa. And Manasa uh, is thinking. So Manasa is the process of thinking. So this is thinking. In fact, this is the word also used to describe the differentiation between humans and animals. Human beings are called what? Manasa or Manusia. I think in, uh, yeah, in some languages based on Sanskrit, it is called Manusia. And in the case of, I think, Sinhalese or Pali, it is Manusa. Right? So this is referring to an animal or a creature that thinks that is human being. Manasa is the thinking process. And therefore, if that thinking is corrupted, see now it's referring to thinking that is corrupted, not the mind. It is the thinking that is corrupted. And if you begin to speak or act because of that, you begin to experience, that person will experience suffering as though it is the wheel following the hoof of the animal. So you can see this is really another translation that explains it is a process of thinking. It is not the mind. Mind is a big word. Right? Mind involves three things. Vijnana, which is perception. Mano, which is cognition and conception. And Chitta, which is then mood and temperament. Our feeling and our emotional urges. So here, Mano is referring to the thinking process. So with that, I hope this has been very clear to you, the meaning of the first verse of the Dhammapada. It's the way you think that creates your reality. If you think good, then your reality will be wholesome. If you think evil, then your reality will be unwholesome. This is why it's very common to say, think good, speak good, and do good. That's really what it is. Now let's take a look at the second verse, which is the opposite of the first verse. So here it's the same thing, except now it's talking about uh, the good, good mind and the goodness, right? So let's listen again one more time to Bhante Indratana chanting the second verse. Manu So now let's take a look at the story behind the second verse. It is the story of this young man called Mata Kundali. I think, I think he was just a teenager, a young man. Uh, he came from a Brahmin family. That means these are a noble family. And his father, a very rich man, Adina Pubaka. He was very rich, but very stingy. So very misery or misery, yeah. very stingy. He doesn't donate to charity. He doesn't give anything away. He's holding on to his money. Like it means everything to him. His money is more important than his life. In fact, his money is more important than his son's life. So one day when his son contracted jaundice, it became very sick. His son fell very ill because of jaundice. And the father would not call a physician to come and say, uh, to treat the son. He was so miser misery so stingy that he didn't want to spend money to invite a doctor to come and take care of the son. He just allowed the son to get sick and hope that the son will, get, will, will recover by himself. Even the wife actually was pleading and he refused to pay for a doctor to come and treat the son. Until one day the son became very, very sick. So when he realized his son was dying, very, very sick, even then he was not going to call a doctor. And what did he do? Oh, very terrible thing. He got his servants to take the son back to the back veranda at the back so that he's out of view. When people enter the house, they won't see the son. Right? They can't see the son. Normally, the son will be there in, in the front. But now the son is hidden away in the back. Nobody can see. And because he was uh, embarrassed about his son being sick, but the son was dying. And of course, one day, 
uh, one morning when the Buddha awoke from his meditation, his deep meditation, normally the first thing what the Buddha normally does when he awakes from his early morning deep meditation is he just scans around to see if there's anything happening. And he scanned and saw Matakundali with his divine sight. He was able to see that there's Matakundali lying uh, on the veranda in the house. So the Buddha that morning, going out for alms food together with some disciples, decided to go near to the house of Adina Pubaka. Right? So the Buddha went to the house and stood nearby the door and together they were uh, taking alms round, doing their alms round. And at the same time, the Buddha realized that Matakundali was lying inside dying. So the Buddha sent a, a psychic message to tr attract the attention of the young boy. And of course, the Buddha was all powerful. So the young boy was able to sense that the Buddha is calling him. So his mind became very attuned, very focused on the thought that the Buddha is nearby. And Therefore, he, he, in his mind, he, he was very devoted to the teachings of the Buddha because they were all following the Buddha's teachings. So in this case, this young boy was so devoted that even though he was very weak in his mind, he professed his devotion to the Buddha. So in his mind, he was constantly very de dedicated and devoted to thinking about the Buddha and what the Buddha had taught. So his mind was very purely focused on the Buddha. Right? So he was not distracted by his own illness or anything else. Very focused. And then, of course, the boy was beyond help. So he finally passed away with his mind focused on the Buddha. His mind was not distracted. His mind was focused on the Buddha and then he passed away. And then because of that, he was reborn in Tavatimsa, celestial world, in the higher world. Right? Not as another human being, but up in the Tavatimsa, celestial world. So he was reborn there. And then the Buddha, of course, knew that. And from his celestial world, he was able to see that his father was grieving now in the end. It's too late. He's already, the sun has already passed, has already gone, passed away. And the father was grieving and moaning over the sun at the cemetery. So the Buddha, Mata Kundali in the celestial world, well, of course, he's no longer Mata Kundali. He's now a celestial being. He's now in that uh, Tavatimsa realm. He came down in his old, uh, uh, old appearance. That means his original appearance as the sun appeared before his father and, and basically spoke to his father. And he told his father, uh, that he is now reborn in the higher realm. Don't worry about him. He's fine. He's happy. And then he urged the father in helping the father, please invite the Buddha to your house and serve the Buddha. So this was a message that he told the father and the father realized that is a message from the son who is now reborn. So the father was very happy that the son is reborn in the, in the celestial world, no longer in the lower world. So therefore, he invited the Buddha together with some of Buddha's disciples. So at the house, they were having this uh, dana for the Buddha. And then a discussion came up. The question arose, whether or not a person could be reborn in the higher realm simply by mentally professing profound devotion to the Buddha, right? The person doesn't have to engage in any activity, but if the mind is purely, uh, here it is, purely focused on the Buddha, and when the person passes away, can that person be reborn? Of course, it has happened. The answer, of course, is yes, it can happen. So the Buddha, uh, in order to make them realize this, the Buddha is one of the things about the Buddha in many stories you will see. The Buddha doesn't answer people very directly, yes or no, you know? So the Buddha summoned the Mata Kundali from the Tavatimsa realm to ask him now to appear as a deva. So he's now, a, Mata Kundali re a, reappeared in his celestial form, no longer in his old 
form as Mata Kundali. So this is really the celestial being that was formerly Mata Kundali. Now he appeared in his full celestial ornaments. That means his, uh, his divine shape, divine form. And then told about his rebirth. In other words, Mata, uh, this celestial being of Mata Kundali explained the answer to everybody that it is possible if the mind is purely focused. So... Only then the audience became convinced by simply devoting the mind. And here when they say devoting the mind, it is very pure devotion. And therefore, this was an explanation that he could be reborn. And therefore, when uh, the father heard that, the father realized his mistake. The father corrected himself and started to devote himself to the teachings of the Buddha. Of course, the rest of the story was not explained in detail. But because the father devoted himself to the teachings of the Buddha, he had finally attained Sotapan. And in fact, Mata Kundali, the celestial being of Mata Kundali, also attained uh, Sotapan because they were both listening to the teachings of the Buddha to the point that they are able to purify their mind to the state of be, uh, becoming Sotapan. And, Mata, and the father, Adina Putbaka, he was still alive, uh, started donating all his wealth to other people and specifically also to help to uh, expand the Buddha's teachings. So he was donating to the course of the Buddha's teaching. So this is the story. And therefore, the Buddha uttered this verse. The first part is the same. Cognition precedes all experiences. It predominates and creates our reality. With virtuous thought, if one speaks or acts, that means if the mind is pure and it is directed only at goodness, virtuous thought, if you begin to speak or act, you will experience happiness. And this happiness is like a shadow that is attached to you that is inseparable. That means you will always be experiencing this happiness like it is your inseparable shadow. Now again, the Buddha very brilliantly used the shadow because the shadow is something that is light. The shadow is not burdensome. The shadow is not something that is painful. Whereas the, the ox and the cart, draw, uh, the ox drawing the cart is a very painful thing. The shadow is something so light. It, it is something that does not hurt you in any way. So it's like a shadow following you. So happiness will follow you like your inseparable shadow. If you were to live your life, with virtuous thinking. Think good, speak good, and do good, and you will experience happiness. And this is really the essence of what these two verses are trying to teach us. So I hope this has been helpful to you. I'm very thankful to Bhante Punaji for having taught me and having explained to me a lot of these things. I, I am, as far as all this Dharma work is concerned. I am who I am. Largely, very thankful to Bhante Ponenji. And here is his uh, quote I would like to leave with you to help you understand. The purpose of human intelligence is not to discover the truth, but to solve problems. And this is precisely what the Buddha was trying to teach us. The Dharma is his, coming from his experience, how to solve the problem. The Dharma is not some truth the Buddha took from the heaven and passed it to people. No. The Buddha was teaching from his own experience all his past lives and his last life as Prince Siddhartha and as an ascetic. So he was telling us the medial way to stay away from indulging in sensual pleasures because he was a prince living in a luxurious environment and to stay away from ascetism self-mortification because he had become an ascetic. And therefore, the medial way is the Eightfold Way, to practice the Eightfold Way. That's why Dharma is not truth, so to speak. Dharma is the Buddha's experience to help us. So therefore, the purpose of human intelligence is not to discover truth, but to solve problem. And what is the problem to be solved? The problem of Dukkha. Right? So this is the problem of Dukkha. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, the problem of existence. Everything is impermanent. It's always changing and evolving. And it leads to all kinds of suffering and pain and stress and sorrow. And at the end of the day, 
It is nothing personal. Don't think I, me, or mine. Don't get personal with it and start to create the I, me, or mine. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And that is really the solution that the Buddha has offered. So with that, I basically bring my sharing to an end. So if you have any questions, please type your question under the comment of this live post. Uh, but keep your question short. Don't make it uh, three or four paragraphs. You know, A nice, simple sentence asking the question. So please type in your questions now. So that is the end of my sharing. Over to you, uh, Bobby. Thank you, Brother Billy. Your, I find your sharing has gotten much better over the years. Comes with experience. <laughs> yeah. You mean I wasn't really good before? <laughs> no, no, you are good. Now you are getting much more polished. Ah, okay. Much, much, much sadu, 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 sadu. Okay, we like to kick off with a question from Bliss Rizal. Sounds like a Filipino name. Uh, yes. Yeah, question is. is: What will uh, are the will the different consequences be if the doctor perceives visuals in mind only, but did not execute it? In the story Dhammapada verse one, doctor executed. So what happens if he didn't execute just it by thought? So in other words, uh, the question is: If a person was thinking something very nasty, vicious thinking, uh, intentions, intentions are there but did not do it. In other words, or we take another situation where a person is so angry with another person, I want to kill him, but he didn't kill him. But the mind is thinking. So the Buddha did say. Now I mentioned to you those three things come together. Chetana, which is think, uh, volition or intention. Karma, which is the actual action. And Vipaka, which is the consequence of the action. Collectively, people refer to this collectively as karma, so to speak. Of course, it's used in, the word karma is used incorrectly. But the Western world, they started referring to the three together as karma. That's why the word karma is also referring to the outcome. But actually, it is referring to the complete three things. Chetana, which is volition or intention. Karma, which is the action. And finally, vipaka, which is the consequence. And the Buddha did say, Chetana is karma. In other words, your mind thinking of something vicious, you have already created mental karma. So that vicious thinking is embedded into your memory. And how it hurts you is in the future, you start to think and you get reminded, oh, I want to kill him, I want to kill him. Even though you didn't kill him, but your mind keeps saying, I want to kill him, I want to kill him. That is also suffering, you know, because it's stressing you. So that itself is also bringing you dukkha. So therefore, even thinking itself is karma. Of course, it's not as strong and not as uh, negative as actually killing that person, but it is still uh, not, good, uh, not good karma. And you will inherit these negative merits, uh, or we call it demerits. So I hope that answers the first question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Brother Billy. Another question from uh, Brother Mui. How did the Buddha thought about time management? Did the Buddha? Yeah, there are a few sutras where the Buddha did teach uh, a few things. I'm not too familiar with them, so I really will not be able to answer that because that is not uh, connected with this particular sharing today. I've prepared well for this sharing. Uh, I must apologize, I didn't prepare to answer these other things about how you can live your conventional life. When you talk about time sharing, you, you're really talking about the, the mundane life. So I didn't really that. But I think there are a few sutras that mention a little bit about these things. Uh, there are also a few Dharma talks in, in uh, the internet you can Google where monks are explaining all this. So I must apologize for that. It's all right. The, another question from Brother A.L. Chan. If the blind man accidentally steps on the insects or ants, would this be considered sinful? How to clear the sins? Uh, okay, I don't want to use the word sin. The Buddha also never used the word sin. The Buddha used the word wholesome or unwholesome actions. And I mentioned before, this whole thing we call karma is made of chetana, the intention, karma, the action, vipaka, the consequence. That blind 
monk walking, stepping out of his kuti and start to do walking meditation, stepped on the insect. There was no intention. So in other words, without intention, it would not be bad karma for him in that sense. And at the same time also, we have all learned that an enlightened being does not create this kind of karma anymore. Because that enlightened being is completely freed of those three unwholesome roots, right? Loba, dosa, moha, right? So therefore, an enlightened person does not create karma. But even for a normal person, if you don't have intention to do anything bad, but you accidentally caused harm, okay, you may not have intended to cause harm. I'll give you a simple example. I think this is a very common example. We're driving a car and somebody drives a little bit fast. And then suddenly somebody dashed across the road and the car hit that person. So you injured someone or in the worst case, you may even have killed that person. But you were driving the car. You didn't want to hit that person and that person just got in front of you and you ran over that person and, and hurt that person. Did you create karma? You did not create the karma of killing or hurting that person, but you did create the karma of driving without caution, driving mindlessly, unmindful driving, knowing that unmindful driving can lead to accidents. You still drive unmindfully at a speed which is unsafe, depending on the road. If you're talking about superhighway, driving 90 to 100 kilometers per hour is quite safe, uh, as long as you have good vision and you are careful. But if you're talking about city roads, even driving at 30, 40 kilometers an hour is, can be very unsafe if you're driving through a school zone. So if you're driving past a school, slow down as much as you can because little children are running around, you know? So you'll know that driving unmindfully can actually cause accidents. So you are guilty of the karma of driving unmindfully and because of your unmindful driving, somebody got hurt not because you wanted to hurt that person. So you're not guilty of the intention of wanting to hurt that person, but you are guilty of the intention of driving in an unmindful and without caution, knowing that driving fast uh, can cause hurt, harm to people and to yourself and to your passengers. So I hope that answers your question. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please keep the questions flowing in. I don't see any new questions here. There's a 15 second to 20 second delay. Okay, while waiting for the questions to flow in, uh, a short promotion. Tonight, we are having a book launch by Dr. Punia Wong from Metalodge JB. So BGF will be streaming live as well at uh, 8 p.m. from our BGF Facebook. The book is on uh, busting myths of the, busting a lot of myths. So Dr. Punia Wong <coughs> wrote a short book to compile a few of these myths busters. And also on the 1st of November, we are having Venerable Sumangala here to talk about overcoming modern hindrances. That means the use of handphones and other other problems, which are <clears throat> which are we find to be a lot of distractions in our daily modern world. So first of November, and also we have just launched a retreat with uh, Acham Brahm and Acham Brahmali. It will be a virtual retreat this time from the 24th to the 29th of December. So do sign in. You can see the link in our Facebook page here and also through your email or WhatsApp, okay? Okay, now there's a question from uh, Barbara Yen. Brother Billy, thank you very much for this wonderful sharing. I cannot quite accept when you said to suppress the emotions. Example, if a person is abused over the years and kept suppressing his or her emotions, this can cause them greater harm. Do you mean to be aware of these negative emotions and to express them? 
Okay. Uh, I th I thank you, Sister Barbara, for the question. I think uh, maybe I have misstated. I was not saying about suppressing emotion. In fact, I'm one person who does not believe in suppressing emotion because that is one of the things the Buddha warned us to refrain from, self-mortification. When you have an emotional urge, you suppress it and you force it down. No, that doesn't happen. You learn to relax and you can overcome it. I use the word suppression not as a verb, but uh, something that has happened. That means if you are able to tame and calm your emotion, I'm just talking about in meditation, huh? in the context of meditation, if you're able to calm your, your emotion, you would have suppressed your five hindrances. So in other words, it's the five hindrances that are being suppressed that they do not arise. But I, I, I was referring to that in, uh, in the context of meditation. But I can see in your question here, you're referring to if a person is abused over the years and kept suppressing his or her emotions, this can cause them greater harm. So what you are referring to is really a person who is continuously being subjected to all kinds of, of abuse and that person just holding back. Of course, we don't keep uh, suppressing. First, we learn to relax and we learn to let go. You know, so in other words, not to let go the fact that you, you are being hurt, but let go of any ill will towards uh, the person who is hurting you. So it's really learning how to relax. I actually teach that simple technique called pause, relax, and think. So when something, somebody does something to you and arouses your emotion and make you feel all angry and tense and all that, Instead of suppressing it, what you do is you pause first. Don't react right away because your reaction is tend to be very emotional. Then pause and then just relax. Learn to relax and then think. And when you begin to think, you begin to realize that if you were to react negatively towards the person who have either hurt you or saying something bad to you, then you are creating worsening the situation. But what you should do is then you must respond in a way that is helpful to the situation. And in fact, I use the word think as an acronym, T-H-I-N-K. When you want to respond to something or react to something, and when you begin to think about it, you're no longer reacting blindly. You are now responding. T, is this something that is truthful? When you want to say something to someone, is it truthful? Instead of shouting back at that person with bad words or nasty words, or reacting in that way, then is it truthful? Is that person really like that? No. So... Truthful, helpful. Will it help you recover from the problem? So in other words, what you say, will it be helpful to recover? Uh, I, I means improve. Will it help to improve your relationship with that person? Will it help to improve your circumstances? N, N means necessary. What you're about to say, is it really necessary? Sometimes some things may be true, but it may not be necessary to say. So if that person is a very cruel person, right? I'm assuming that you have that situation. That person is very cruel, being cruel to you. Of course, it is true that that person is cruel, but it may not be necessary for you to say back to that person, you are such a cruel person, you know? So sometimes think about it. Is it necessary? Because telling him he's cruel isn't going to help him. Telling him that you are hurt, that might help. But telling him that, he is such a cruel person. You are just creating friction. You are just creating more conflict. And finally, K, that is the most important of all, kindness. So when you respond, always respond with kindness. So this is really what I meant. I never teach people to suppress emotions, never. I teach people to pause, relax, and think. And that is responding in a positive and wholesome way, right? So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, another question from Brother A.L. Chan on a similar theme, revengeful mind. Is it considered as bad karma, but it is created by someone else to you first? Revengeful mind. <laughs> okay, it is not who did it first. If somebody ha hurt you and you want to hurt that person back, you are as bad as that person. So yes, thinking one thing to hurt someone itself is already bad karma. That is mental karma. And I have this very popular saying, I've come across this very popular saying, 
what you do to me is your karma. How I react to you is my karma. So I hope that I understand when somebody is hurting you, is bad to you, that person has created bad karma. But the way you react back to that person, that is your karma. So you have to be careful not to create bad karma in that sense. Therefore, when somebody is hurting you or doing something that is unwholesome to you, what did I say earlier on? Pause, relax, think. Truthful, helpful, improving, necessary, and kind. That's, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, very good tip. I think this is a very good question uh, by Renga Devaraj. What is the best translated book to read Dhammapada? Uh, I will give you the link afterwards. <laughs> you will download this from Bhante Sarada. Uh, this commentary I, I have is only his commentary, not the translations. A very good translation I find is Buddha Ratikita. You can actually Google that. Just Google Dhammapada. Buddha Rakita, and you will be able to find many PDF files all over the internet where he has translated it into English. I would find Buddha Rakita's uh, translation to be most modern. Whereas Narada's translation, although it was widely used, it is more from a very traditional point of view. But uh, if you want explanation then, the commentary, I'm going to, uh, I'll give you the link to Sarada's commentary. If you want explanation, use Sarada's commentary. If you want the actual translated English text, use Buddha Rakita, because I find Buddha Rakita's translation to be very modern and easily, it resonates with modern thinking. Okay, another question the link from in a moment, yeah. Okay, another question from Brother Riz Please Rizal. The thought automatically pops, unwholesome and wholesome thoughts. What happens when unwholesome thoughts that may be vicious, but no emotions, no volition or intention, just pops up? Am I subject to karma? Okay, what pops up if you don't have an intention to do harm, what pops up is called an urge. It is an instinctive, mental instinctive reaction. So when there is an urge, if you practice pause, relax and think, when that urge arises and you just relax and you let go, right? And you don't want to dwell on it, then you are doing good. So in other words, you are not creating any karma. In other words, karma is not pop, popping up of thoughts. Popping up of thoughts is something from your past karma. Yeah? Because chitta is a collection of many things. It's also including your past karma, past life karma, and also the karma coming... Uh, from your upbringing and so on. So they will produce emotional urge, the urge to want to do or think something bad. But then you realize and you are able to discern, this is not good, calm down, you know. There's a sutra, I forgot the actual reference, but there's a sutra where the Buddha said, before he became enlightened, he was discerning between two types of thoughts, good thoughts and bad thoughts, and he was able to discern them. And when it is bad thoughts, he learned to let them go. So that is really what it is. This urge, these thoughts do arise, but the arising of the thought itself is not bad karma, but entertaining that thought, dwelling on it, considering it, recollecting it, remembering it, that is bad karma. So learn to let go if unwholesome thoughts arise. And this is part of this Samatha meditation. There are uh, uh, four techniques that help you. Uh, it's, uh, in this uh, right effort, they call it Sama Vayama, the right effort, where you can learn how to let go unwholesome thoughts and purify your mind. So learn to meditate. Meditation can help you in this way, reducing these instinctive urges arising. And if the less they arise, then the less you are risking getting involved with unwholesome thoughts. So always, please, uh, meditate. Uh, by the way, Bliss Rizal is a good friend of mine. She's in the Philippines, and she's one of the people who have been following uh, many of my, my sharings in the Philippines. Right, thank you, sister, for asking these wonderful questions. Very helpful. I hope this answers your question. If it doesn't, please feel free to message me later, whatever, or pop in another question. Okay? Bobby? Okay, I think that's all the questions for today. 
So anyone has any questions, uh, just uh, put it in Facebook and uh, I think Brother Billy will pick it up later after the talk and uh, hopefully he can reply. <clears throat> so with this, uh, Billy would like to close with your sharing of merits. Yeah, okay. All right, so... Now, I mentioned to you before, there are links. So the first link is the slides for this sharing, for today's sharing. Feel free to download all the slides and you can look at uh, what I have prepared here. I spent a lot of time preparing, so please make good use of it. And then the second one is this Dhammapada by Venerable Sarada. So you can see this link, tiny.cc slash Dhammapada dash Sarada. And you can download the commentary of Venerable Sarada. And in my presentation slides, you will notice there is a link, uh, there is a mention of the website of uh, Venerable Sarada in Singapore. So you can actually go to his website and see. Unfortunately, I think, uh, I don't know about his condition, but I think he has not start, done a lot of Dharma teachings, but a lot of meditation and uh, chanting. So please feel free to connect to his website. My email address is down there and also my Facebook link. If you have any questions later on, please feel free to message me or send me an email. So let's now get into the sharing of the merits. We are in good time, exactly 11.30 now. So we have spent these past one and a half hours together sharing the Dharma and we have all benefited from it. And with this good intention, good action, we have created good outcomes of learning something, sharing something, and appreciating something. We have accumulated good merits. Let us now think about a lot of people around the world who are experiencing the same problem. Billions of people around the world are experiencing this coronavirus pandemic. Right? And millions have died. So we are very thankful that we are able to sit here today to enjoy sharing the Dharma and we must think about people who are suffering. So let us now put our palms together and share our merits with all the people who are suffering from coronavirus pandemic by reciting this together. We dedicate the merits we have acquired from sharing of the Buddha Dharma to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. May suffering beings be suffering free. May fear struck be fear, uh, fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. By the grace of the merits we have acquired, may we never follow the foolish. May we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, Bobby, I'm... Yeah. Thank you, oh. Brother Billy, for the wonderful Dharma sharing and also the uh, very well-answered questions. We will post this uh, Dharma talk on Facebook, BJF Face YouTube later, and uh, we'll put in the links for all the... The slides and the talks from Brother Billy. Okay, so uh, thank you, brothers and sisters, for coming in. And remember to tune in tonight at 8 p.m. for the book launch by Dr. Punya Wong, and also sign up for Acham Brahm's uh, retreat online. Okay, thank you. So thank, thank you, Brother you. Billy, once again. Thank you. Thank you for having okay. me. Sadhu, sadhu, okay. sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. sadhu.